Are you worried you could have syphilis? In this video, I'm going to explain the signs of syphilis as well as how doctors diagnose this elusive infection and what can happen if syphilis is left untreated. I'll give you a hint, it's not pretty. Syphilis is caused by Treponema pallidum, a bacteria with a distinct corkscrew appearance when viewed under a microscope. It's a sexually transmitted infection that has plagued humanity since antiquity. Historical figures, including Adolf Hitler, Frederick Nietzsche, and Abraham Lincoln have all been theorized to have had syphilis infections. More than just an STI, left untreated, syphilis can cause terrible deforming wounds as the bacteria eats away at a person's skeleton and invades their central nervous system, resulting in a slow, debilitating death as the person descends into madness. A syphilis infection progresses through three stages, primary, secondary, and tertiary. Each stage is characterized by certain findings. However, a person might not show all of those findings in each stage. Syphilis has been called the great imitator. This is because the signs and symptoms of the infection are elusive and they resemble the signs of other diseases. And so doctors might not immediately think about syphilis when they're examining a patient and trying to figure out the diagnosis. They might not even consider syphilis or order the diagnostic testing for it. In the first stage, primary syphilis, an ulcer develops in the genital region. And characteristically, this ulcer is usually painless, although sometimes it can be painful. A person will usually also have pain in the inguinal lymph nodes. This is because the person's immune immune system is attempting to fight back the infection as it tries to invade into the body. Over the course of a few weeks to a month, the ulcer will heal and the person might not realize that anything is wrong. In the second stage of syphilis, the bacteria has now gained access to the bloodstream and is spreading to the rest of the person's body. This is why the signs and symptoms of secondary syphilis or are more diffuse. Signs and symptoms of secondary syphilis include a maculopapular rash that characteristically affects a person's palms and soles. This is why whenever I'm examining a patient for STIs, I always pay close attention to their palms and oftentimes I'll even look at their feet to see if I can find any rash. There's really not many infections or other diseases that give a rash on the palms or soles. And so if I'm able to find this, then it gives me a hint as to what the person might have. A person with secondary syphilis will usually also have fevers as well as generalized lymphadenopathy. So they might have enlarged lymph nodes in their neck or maybe in their armpit. If these are present, then again, it gives us a hint that there may be a syphilis infection present. After the second stage, Syphilis then enters a dormant period called latency. If it's less than a year from when the person was infected, we call that the early latent period. And when it becomes more than a year, we call that the late latent period. During the latency period, a person will be asymptomatic, meaning they don't have any signs or symptoms, they feel fine, they don't even notice anything is wrong. However, they still have the syphilis infection and they're even capable of transmitting it to another person. Finally, after the latency period, syphilis enters its third and most devastating stage, tertiary syphilis. Tertiary syphilis is also called gumatous syphilis. This is because of these lesions that form throughout the body called gumas. And although these gumas can form anywhere in the body, they usually form on the person's skeleton. These gumas are responsible for the horrific disfiguring lesions you can see in photos of people who have suffered from tertiary syphilis. As the gumas invade their skeleton and the bones of their face, the tissues begin to split open and bleed and swell. It's an absolutely terrible, painful, horrific process. Syphilis has one more devastating form, and that's neurosyphilis. Neurosyphilis occurs when Treponema pallidum invades the tissues of the central nervous system, not just the brain, but also the spinal cord or the eyes, since we consider the eyes as a direct extension of the brain. While neurosyphilis generally occurs in the tertiary stage, it can occur during any stage, including primary or secondary. In fact, neurosyphilis may actually be the initial presenting form that a person comes in with when they first get diagnosed with 
syphilis. If neurosyphilis occurs during the tertiary stage, it usually causes a disease called tabes dorsalis. This is a disease in which the bacteria affects the dorsal columns of the spinal cord. The dorsal columns are responsible for our sense of touch. And so someone with tabes dorsalis may feel numbness in their hands or legs. People may have a decreased sense of vibration as well as a difficult time keeping their balance while walking. We call this gait ataxia. Tabes dorsalis can also result in a very special finding of the eye. The pupil of our eye is responsible for constricting and dilating in order to control the amount of light entering the eye and hitting the retina. So in the dark, a person's pupil will dilate to allow more light in. But when you shine a bright light in a person's eye, their pupil will normally constrict. This decreases the amount of light entering the person's eye. As clinicians, we can check for this by shining a light into a person's pupil and seeing if the pupil constricts appropriately. This is called checking the pupillary light reflex. If this reflex is absent, then we call this an Argyle Robinson pupil. When neurosyphilis occurs in one of the earlier stages of the infection, it usually presents as meningitis. Symptoms of meningitis include headache, neck stiffness, and photophobia. Photophobia being sensitivity to light. A person with photophobia will actually feel pain with bright light, and they'll usually want to either turn the lights off and sit in a dark room, or wear sunglasses. People with meningitis also exhibit lethargy or a decreased level of consciousness. A person with a decreased level of consciousness will seem like they're sleeping and can't be woken up no matter how much you try. This goes back to syphilis being a great imitator. When a person comes in with the signs and symptoms of meningitis, we as doctors don't immediately think about syphilis. This is because the infection isn't one of the typical causes of meningitis, and so it's not going to be one of the first things that we think about when we're trying to figure out what is the cause of a person's meningitis. It might result in a delay in diagnosis because we don't order the appropriate testing to look for the syphilis bacteria. In the pre-antibiotic era, people infected with syphilis would often progress to tertiary syphilis. This is why archaeologists are able to examine the skeletons of people who suffered from syphilis because their bones show the characteristic destruction of the gumas. After the discovery of penicillin in 1928, Syphilis went from a death sentence to one of the most treatable infections. Since then, little has changed in how syphilis is treated. In the era of antibiotic resistance, syphilis remains one of the only infections we treat with basic penicillin. In fact, I almost feel some relief when a patient is diagnosed with syphilis because I at least know that we can easily kill the infection, unlike other infections which may be much more difficult to kill due to antibiotic resistance. For a syphilis infection in the primary and secondary stage, as well as the early latent stage, the treatment is a single dose of long-acting intramuscular benzathine penicillin. For tertiary and in the late latent phase, the treatment is three doses of long-acting benzathine penicillin spaced one week apart. For neurosyphilis, because of how severe these forms of syphilis are, we treat these patients with at least 14 days of intravenous penicillin. In the modern era, pretty much all syphilis infections are diagnosed in the earlier stages, usually either primary, secondary, or in the latent stage. We almost never see infections in the tertiary stage. Personally, I've never seen anyone who has tertiary syphilis. The reason for this, again, is because penicillin is such an effective treatment and because our diagnostic testing for syphilis is very good. This means that infections are diagnosed and treated in the earlier stages before they can progress to the later stage of tertiary syphilis, which generally takes decades. Again, testing for syphilis is easy. It's a simple blood test. And so if you're worried about syphilis, talk to your doctor about it. So I hope this video was helpful and thanks for watching.